Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to COP26. And this is actually, believe it or not, it feels like we've been uh, at COP for several weeks already, but this is actually the first event that we have at COP26. Uh, and it is sustainability in the renewable sector. And I have the pleasure of, uh, well, co-hosting, the Global Wind Energy Council has the pleasure of co-hosting this event with the Global Solar Council. And I'll introduce the CEO of the Global uh, Solar Council, Gianni Cometti, in just a few minutes. But first, I wanted to share some perspectives from the wind industry uh, to talk about the wind industry. So I think it's fair to say that uh, the wind industry, for many years, we've thought that we've had a reliable, uh, uh, sustainable product because we have we produce sustainable energy. But I think that it's become very clear that over the course of the uh, last few years that sustainable, uh, to be sustainable, you need to be sustainable in every area of your operations. And today we've assembled a great panel that's going to be able to have a look at some of these areas. A couple of the areas that we'll be touching upon today is this reaching net zero and decarbonizing the operations in the supply chain, the operations all throughout the supply chain. We'll be having a look at the circular economy and what that means in setting the wind industry standards and design criteria. We'll be touching on the human rights aspects of uh, what we're doing with the wind and, so, and also the environmental impact. And when you think about what's happening in the wind industry, uh, it's the, in terms of the projections, the wind has to do almost, well, I think we were at 750, 760 gigawatts uh, last year, and now we have to get up to 8.3 terawatts by 2050. It's an incredible rate of growth. And if we don't get the sustainability right in the wind industry, then we'll be playing catch up the entire time. So this notion of sustainability is imperative for the wind industry. We really have to all band together and make this happen. And so we've been able to uh, form an alliance with the Global Solar Council. So the two greatest forms of renewable or largest forms of renewable energy that will play the biggest role in the energy transition up to 2050 are going to have bound together in a way that we hope to, I guess, really lift the trajectory of uh, what it means to be sustainable in the renewables industry. And so now I'll have a hand over to you to finish or finalize the opening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, today is a, has been is an important day. The signature of this morning uh, between the two global industry is very uh, important and timely with the COP26, which is uh, after the COP21 is the uh, new restart anyway, with new target, uh, more ambitious uh, ones. A uh, few words about the solar industry. Um, as uh, many of you know already anyway, our uh, the price or the cost of uh, solar energy is really going down, down, and is very competitive already. And this uh, gives us uh, confidence on the potential to reach the goal of uh, the 2030 to 2050. Of course, uh, if we manage to take out some bottlenecks, like, uh, of course, uh, authorization process uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, regarding the solar, a few solar data anyway, from the global market outlook that uh, um, uh, of uh, SOPA Europe, uh, supported by Global Solar Council, 39% um, of the new uh, energy generation uh, will come from solar with a lot of, of course, uh, employees, uh, job, jobs creation. And uh, according to the International Energy Agency and also the, the IRENA, uh, IRENA, this means that uh, uh, they grow. Uh, if we really uh, follow the 1.5 uh, pathway, uh, we manage to boost the GDP by 2030 of 2.4%, which is huge, means that we are going to um, uh, have uh, three times uh, jobs in the renewable sectors, which is uh, we count will count around 40 million uh, people, new jobs. And uh, this will be very, um, uh, very important, but possible only really if we manage to join forces 
to work together and we managed really to um, um, uh, take out all these uh, obstacles starting from the authorization process. Um, very important uh, uh, in this uh, big enormous growth is the link with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And uh, uh, here we come to the Global Alliance for Sustainable Energy, which is focused on uh, disseminating the sustainable values in the whole value chain, starting from the manufacturing to the end customer, the end users. And, um, and because we cannot have a, a grow without thinking to human rights, as my colleague said, to, we are thinking about ethics, governance, etc and uh, um, jobs creation, of course, and what we said before. And uh, um, at the link with, um, there is a direct link with the circular economy, for instance. If you think that in the solar business, um, uh, many, anyway, panels are reaching, um, anyway, end of life. Anyway, there, there will be a multi-billion dollars economy coming from, uh, the recycling, if we think that uh, solar panels uh, are made of a very recycling, a very important uh, components uh, from aluminum, glass, uh, coppers, and so on. And um, uh, thinking about uh, the link with the sustainability, um, uh, a lot of growth uh, will come. Uh, uh, we are going to pass uh, uh, one terabat in the 2022. And a lot of uh, this number will come, uh, grow, will come from, of course, uh, Europe, USA, China, India, but from Africa, almost 50% could come from Africa in, in the coming years. And if we think that uh, the population is going to double, and if we think that uh, in Africa we have uh, uh, a lot of, uh, um, anyway, uh, children without uh, uh, energy, power, 300 million children without power, well, solar, wind together can give uh, power to this, uh, to new, uh, the new generation. And this, we come to the sustainability aspect uh, in that sense. So um, I think is uh, um, it is the right moment. The solar and wind can lead uh, this uh, transition together, um, but also embracing the other technology because a global alliance for sustainable energy has the goal also to represent and engage also the other sustainable energy, geotherm, and so on so it will be very important so having said that i think it's um, just a short introduction and the uh, global solar cancer which we work uh, uh, are planning also to take the lead of uh, the secretariat uh, uh, in uh, one year time or maybe less and uh, and so um, i think it's an important moment today to launch this initiative again Thank you very much. I give the floor to uh, Marit Adler, Executive Director of Student Energy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, as you said, I'm Meredith Adler. I'm the Executive Director of Student Energy. We're a global network of 50,000 young people in over 120 different countries who are working to become the next generation of energy leaders. And we're really excited to see the launch of the Alliance and to be a partner on the Alliance because um, as we're talking about jobs, as we're talking about the future, the build out of of energy in regions that currently lack energy access. A lot of that will be happening with young people who will be the workforce, but also young people are often right now pushing for more of a holistic lens on the energy transition, especially when it comes to human rights, supply chains and other important crucial pieces. And so really excited to see this initiative coming out. Um, so I'll be your moderator here today and I'm joined by some fantastic panelists. Uh, virtually, we have um, Salvatore Bernabe, uh, the CEO of Enel Green Power, uh, here in person. We have Ben Hunt, the, corp the Global Head of Corporate Affairs for Siemens Gimse. We have Gail Schuler, the Chief Sustainability Officer of 3M, who will be joining us virtually. Um, and we have Morten Durholm, the Group uh, Sustainable senior vice president, sorry, uh, not sustainable vice president, um, of marketing, communications, and sustainability in public affairs at Vestas. Um, so wonderful to have you all join us here today. Um, and in lieu of, of reading out bios, I think we'll just hop straight in uh, to the panel. Um, and really, my first question for all of you, as I mentioned, you know, from a student energy perspective, we were surprised, but incredibly excited to see the launch of the Alliance. Um, but for all of you, can you speak to a little bit of 
why now? And what is the alliance meant to address? And how really are you making this different from the other pieces we have going on in energy? We know that there are many renewable energy associations, all kinds of different things happening, but why was it important for everyone to come together as part of the alliance? I can start out and, and thank you for inviting me for the panel. Um, just, I mean, from a general perspective, and Ben and I was actually just talking about it here before, that I think for a long time, as we in the wind and also in the solar business have been sort of seen upon and maybe also viewed ourselves as sort of a niche area of the energy industry. Uh, we're sort of coming into a different phase now where we have to sort of um, get the perception right here that we are becoming sort of the backbone or, or have to become the backbone of the future energy system. And that just gives us a completely different place and responsibility uh, as, as, as players in this market. Uh, I saw, sometimes refer to it as, you know, we're growing up uh, and when you're adults in the room, you suddenly have to take that responsibility on you, right? And that entails that we can no longer hide behind our products. You know, yeah, we are building sustainable products, but we have to make sure now that we don't fall into that trap uh, as the incumbents. We have to make sure that sustainability is in everything we do. And therefore we have to come together because this is not a competitive uh, situation we're in. This is a responsible, mature industry that is reacting and making sure that we are ahead of that curve and not behind it. So that's why we're in and that's why we're working together on this. Fantastic. And maybe we'll turn to Salvatore, who's who's joining us virtually, and we'll trade off between virtual and in person. Hi, Meredith, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Meredith, uh, let me correct a little bit the question. You asked uh, why now? I think the correct uh, question should be why you are del you have delayed so much the launch of these initiatives, because the reality is that we are in a tremendous delay. And uh, I'm not saying that because it's my personal opinion. I think that uh, it's in front of us. Uh, we are observing every day the devastation of the different floodings uh, all around Europe, China, or uh, the climate effects on the west coast of the United States and Canada. Uh, the July 2021 has been the hottest uh, month in the last 142 years. So, I mean, something has happened and is, uh, is uh, causing a lot of uh, impact all over the world. So we are in delay, this is the reality. And uh, I would like to add to that also that uh, what we understood from the latest IPCC report is that the 1.5 degree increase of temperature will be achieved with a high probability in the next two decades. So we really don't have a lot of time and we have to act urgently. That's why we launched these initiatives today. Uh, and in fact, it was launched on September uh, to be precise, but we want to go over uh, beyond the concept of a green electricity. These initiatives uh, had been um, founded by some industrial players, but not, not only industrial, also players in the renewable field uh, who, who works on the uh, industrial part, but also who are providers of services uh, or are contractors. And, and we intended to give a, a broader perspective to the, to the topic. So we also invited uh, some other uh, stakeholders uh, like a youth association, students energy or other association like youth climate leaders joined us and we want them on board. Because one of the new features of this alliance, uh, respect to others who were uh, founded in the past, is that we really want to listen and then to act together with other players, not only from the industry. So we have also involving uh, several NGOs, uh, the world of academy. We want to focus on what, but also to define together how, because we have to act, but we have to act in a coordinated way. Also, because when it comes to sustainability, a lot of people speak about sustainability, but at the end, you never know what people are discussing about. So we want to define the new KPIs, new metrics that really define end-to-end -end what really means sustainable. When I refer to end-to-end, -end, and when they refer to the fact that we want to go beyond the concept of green electricity, we want to focus uh, from the first end, that is the extraction of raw material, to the last end, that is the dismantling on the plant or the possible uh, second life of it. So everything should be sustainable. Everything should have uh, the lower possible impact. And that's why we have to focus on net zero, but also CO2 reduction, water print, uh, water footprint also, not only CO2 footprint. 
because at the end, all the resources that are needed to manufacture a certain product or to provide certain services is precious. Now we are working, we are speaking about energy, but one day we will start speaking about the scarcity of water. That is another problem. So everything make it sustainable or not. And it's not uh, only an environmental issue. The, the sense of this alliance is that uh, it wants to address uh, the issue of sustainability from the different perspective. So very holistic approach. So environmental approach, technical approach, but also impact on society. So we want to treat all the possible benefits or impacts in the entire uh, uh, chain of the stakeholders. In, uh, involving the civil society, as told before, and focusing on these four areas, uh, trying to put some order, eh? trying to define together with all the possible stakeholders involved what really means sustainable, and then act immediately. Because as I said at the beginning, we don't have time. We are late already. Thank you, and I think that's an excellent point. On on you know now might even be a little late, but it's the right. It's always the right time to get going. Um, and Ben, over to you, and then we'll hear from Gail virtually. Yes, yeah, so I think there's there's no question that that the the, the the growing sense of urgency that we've seen over the over the past few years, we can see with our own eyes that things are uh, uh, you know that climate change is is accelerating in its impact, and therefore there is an urgency to to act uh, now. Um, and to Morton's point earlier, there's no question that there's a maturity on our industry now that, that didn't exist perhaps a few years ago, and that we actually have to now respond um, more, um, more quickly and more comprehensively than we have done in the past. And there's another really important point there is, um, you know, to, to some extent, we're being held to a high standard by investors and other stakeholders. But a lot of the impetus now comes from uh, our employees, right? I, I, so many of the people that I've met and are only relatively new to the industry, uh, not just in my own company, but in others, they are here because they want to make a difference. And so they hold us to a higher standard than otherwise might be the case. So, you know, it's, it's um, you know, when you have discussions with um, employees, particularly younger employees, they want to understand what you're doing. You know, what are we doing about our emissions? What are we doing about recyclability and, and the, um, you know, the sustainable economy. And so um, that, that focuses you know, management minds. If they hear it on one hand from their employees and the other hand from investors, then that's going to make a difference. Yeah, that's fantastic. And Gail, I would love to hear from you on this as well. Well, well this has been great. I've really appreciated um, all the comments. So with Wharton talking about suddenly being the grown-ups at the table, I can completely relate on this concept. Now, um, we've also heard from Salvador talking about the urgency and the devastation that's underway. And Ben talking about stakeholders like investors and especially employees. There's three themes that you're gonna hear me talk about throughout today as I answer the questions. It'll be about urgency, science and collaboration. So specifically this question focuses on urgency. Why now? Uh, the, all the points that my colleagues have made are completely valid. This is a critical time, whether it's that we can do more, what that we, um, are expected and need to take action because of the challenges that the world and the people on it are facing or the expectations of our stakeholders. Specifically on the first point, uh, building on the being grown-ups at the grown-up table now as we come into the Thanksgiving season in, in uh, North America, 3M first started our uh, renewable energy goals in 2015. We thought we were making a really bold goal that, that for our global electricity footprint across 70 different countries, we would go to 25% renewable energy by 2025. That was a 10-year goal. We achieved it in three years. That was because there was so much passion. Those employees, investors, we were able to deliver on that goal much faster than we anticipated. So then we doubled down in 2019 and committed to 50% by 2025 with a end commitment to 100%. I'm here to tell you that today we are having days when we are running at our 50% run rate already in 2021. The movement on renewable energy is happening faster than at least we ever anticipated. We've been contributing products like things that help um, wind turbines last longer, things that help solar energy panels be more efficient since the inception of these industries. But now is really when it's taking off. Now is when we have the urgency because we can do it. 
because the world needs us to do it and because our stakeholders are expecting us to do it. So now is a critical time. I'm very excited about participating with these groups of individuals from different perspectives, different places in the world, in different industries, in order to help make the change happen that we need for the world. So we'll, there's going to be a lot of great things to talk about. We can move on to the next question, but thanks for the opportunity to participate. Yeah, and I think these are all fantastic points around why, why now and where we're willing to act. And so the next piece I want to move us on to is really, you know, sustainability, we can all admit, is having a moment. We're here at COP26. There's been a big lead up to that. Um, but, you know, over the course of the pandemic, surprisingly, we've heard so much about climate change and it's great to have it be on the radar. But with that, we're seeing a lot of net zero plans in place and, and now facing a lot of questions about how serious are these plans. So for each of you, you know, why do you see net zero as an important target? And then how do you or your organization plan to actually achieve it? Uh, and maybe we'll go, uh, I'll invite you to go in the same order unless anybody is excited to go first. <laughs> yeah, I can, uh, I can go um, first here. I mean, we um, investors, we set a very clear target to be, uh, to be uh, net zero uh, by 2030 uh, no, and no carbon offsets. I think that's a very important piece of it. Uh, and then uh, full circularity by, uh, by 2040. That's the target. It's very clear. And they're extremely important because they are guiding stars, not just for the employees, but they come from the very top of the company. Uh, and they are considered investors as must win battles. These are something, these are battles we have to win. It is our future license to operate, uh, to get there. So, I mean, you know, it's not just investors. It's also our customers. It's our employees. It's everyone here. Uh, looking at us as an industry and as a company. And if we haven't signed up to the science-based targets, then I, you, know, you don't have the legitimacy to speak about sustainability, in my opinion. And, and we have to walk the talk because we sell sustainable products. And if we can't showcase that we walk the talk ourselves, then that also takes away our legitimacy. So there's a whole host of reasons for why you want to set clear targets. And the key, of course, is now, are you getting there with, the, with your action plans? But we can get to that later. Uh, Salvatore, would you like to come? Yes, thank you. Uh, net zero um, is an objective that uh, uh, the different uh, uh, companies or government uh, are defining. Uh, everyone will define sooner or later uh, a kind of target like this one. But most important is to couple this net zero commitment with 1.5 degree. Uh, because you can be net zero when it, when it is too late, uh, or you can be net zero when, uh, uh, um, I mean, your action is not really effective. Uh, as been mentioned the carbon offsetting. Carbon offsetting is a way to say that I, have, I am net zero, but I'm not really acting on the reduction of emission. So we have to understand that everyone, not only the company, but also the citizens, that we have to change our way to behave to to live uh, industry should change nl for instance who is a company who had and uh, still own some thermal uh, plants uh, is shutting down them and we are uh, focusing only on renewables for the future growth so we are changing our way to to generate electricity but everyone here should understand what is my change because we have to reduce at the end also the consumption of primary energy that's why it's also very important circular economy that is one of the four streams of our uh, alliance for sustainable energy because investing in circular economy means at the end consuming less scarce resources. So 1.5 degrees very important together with net zero and for that NL joined the, the business ambition for 1.5 uh, degree pledge. It means that our curve of CO2 reduction has been certified by the science-based target initiatives. So it's not whatever curve of reduction, it's something that will help to reach net zero and also to stay within the 1.5 degree. So this is very important, it's crucial. We have to be very clear on that. And apart from that, we are working as a company more in general, uh, uh, with some target that uh, um, have been voluntarily defined within the general framework of a sustainable development goals. In particular, um, among the 17 objectives of the United Nations, we have chosen four 
of it. Uh, number seven, that is uh, uh, about uh, um, access to electricity that should be affordable for everyone. Number 13, that is about climate change. And then uh, also number nine and 11, it is about uh, investing in infrastructure to improve the quality of life uh, in the cities. So we took some specific, uh, specific commitment. So coal fits out. By 2027, we are closing all the plants that Enel uh, is running. We are within in the journey, we are going through. We started this uh, work uh, four years ago, and in six years more, we will have completely phased down all the coal. In the meantime, we are investing uh, in renewables. So we will triple our installed capacity by 2030, from the current 50 gigawatt to 150 gigawatt. We are also, as a result of this investment, reducing our CO2 emission according to this science-based target initiatives uh, curve. So we will reach the 82 grams per kilowatt hours of CO2 per kilowatt hours generated. And with respect to objective number 911, we are also investing in um, chargers for the e-cars. E -cars. So we will reach the number of 4 million chargers installed by 2030. 10,000 e-buses managed by our company. And also, referring once more to number seven, object number seven, we will uh, um, increase the number of connection for people who don't have access as per today to electricity uh, to 5.6 additional, 5.6 million of additional people. Today, we serve 73 million end users. We will reach 78.6 million by 2030. So it is a plan. It's a 10 years plan with the intermediate milestone. And this is the way we are uh, trying to leave our mark within the energy transition. Fantastic. Um, ben, over to you. Yeah, so there, um, there, there are a couple of things. The first one of them is that, um, that if, if we are going to keep within this 1.5 degree target, then everybody needs to take responsibility for themselves. Right? There is nothing that we can do about emissions in China or India. Um, there is uh, either as an individual or as a, as a company, what we can do is control our own controllables. And, and what that means is we'd sign up as best as has done to the science based targets. And we know we aim for uh, a meaningful uh, net zero without offsets. Uh, we aim for full, sort of full recyclability um, of our of our turbines um, within a time frame that makes sense. But then the second point is, and, and this I think is perhaps the perspective of, of an outsider to some extent from the industry, it always amused me. Um, a little bit that that the, our industry, the recyclable, the, sorry, the, the renewable industry, is held to a higher standard than than other industries. Right? It's it's so fossil fuel industry can destroy entire ecosystems, right? and um, but your blade is not recyclable. That's still going to be in the ground. Like, oh, okay, so held to that higher standard, we're going to chase that down and make sure that that we can't be had on that. And I think that you know what we've done in the industry over the last sort of you know 10 or 15 years has proved beyond doubt the science that the technology works, that we're sustainable, that we can produce um, cheap electricity. And now going back to Morton's first answer, we have to produce pr pr prove, continually prove that we can do the other bit as well. And that's why we, we signed up and we have a route to get there. I think that's an interesting point, but also a fantastic one is that the industry is being held to a higher standard, but I think also definitely from a youth perspective, that's where the standard is headed. And so it's nice to see these groups leading on it as well. Gail, did you want to elaborate more from your perspective? Sure, you know, I told you in answering the first question, I was gonna talk about urgency, science and collaboration. So this question about net zero is really about science. It's about recognizing what's happening with the climate science and it's about taking action. Um, the first step in taking action is demonstrating credibility. Um, while we certainly have much more to do, I am very pleased to share that 3M has reduced our absolute greenhouse gas emissions by over 70% since 2002. We now have a carbon neutrality commitment that we will be carbon neutral by 2050. And in order to lay out that plan, it's so important that you understand and build that plan on science. So when we just came out with our plan um, publicly this year, in February. And what went into that was a tremendous amount of detailed effort across our organization, across every business, across every location to map out what specific projects would be necessary, what investment was needed, 
how it overlapped with other things we needed to do. There have been comments about the water and energy and how both are so important. We, we see a dramatic, in the manufacturing area, dramatic crossovers between water and energy nexus in terms of the, the greenhouse gas emissions. So when we made our commitment to, uh, to carbon neutrality, we also made a commitment to significant water reductions and water quality improvements because the, the math with a path, if you will, the projects we need to do are, are coupled together. And so when we worked out our path, we, we also identified specific projects, specific actions that take us to a 50% reduction by 2030 and an 80% reduction by 2040 in order to get to that 2050 net zero goal. Um, a big piece of that is renewable, but that's, that's not the only thing. We have heavy manufacturing equipment, so I'm sensitive to the point about why, is, um, why are renewables held to a higher standard? I don't know. Is an industrial company doing lots of manufacturing in lots of areas? I think it's everybody's being held to a higher standard. And the examples that you're given, I'm not sure that those businesses or industries are, are going unscathed as a result of not behaving the way that the world is moving and the expectations from, from an, a sustainability perspective. Um, but we know that while we can focus on, you know, what we can directly control in our own operations and through scope two with our, with our energy sourcing, there's a much bigger piece that comes into that scope three piece. And that's where the collaboration comes in. I'm sure we'll talk more about collaboration, but a big piece is how to work with other companies, whether we're specifying incoming materials that are renewable or have a cleaner value stream or innovating for our customers. We do have a commitment now that every new product that we launch must have a sustainability value commitment. Internally, we call it an SBC. I may slip up and use that word later. But our SBCs or sustainability value commitments, each and every product has to go through a consideration and make a commitment to how it impacts that broader good. It could be environmental, could be social. My advice to the teams is always have multiple options because sometimes in new product development, things don't go the way you plan. It's science, we learn things. And so very often those types of goals come into the carbon footprint. Uh, and that's a really important piece of how we know our, we help our customers really make a difference as well. So net zero is a team sport. It's something we each have to do within our own purview, but then collaborating with others to help make that bigger impact. And it always has to be based on science. Can I ask uh, Gail a uh, question? First of all, I mean, fantastic progress you're making in, in your company. One of the things where we can see from our industry where collaboration really makes an impact uh, is when uh, companies such as yours uh, go to countries and say, we are not going to make significant investments here unless we can procure green electricity in your country. We have seen that in, in places in, in Southeast Asia where, you know, uh, tech companies from the U.S., they band together and they go and demand access to, to clean electricity in order for investments actually to start flowing. And that really makes an impact. Uh, so, so, so that, you know, for us some, in, in our sector, collaboration on that area could be really, really crucial. Yeah, I think that's really important. If you look at, I've talked about our renewable energy progress, and I'm proud that we've gone to, like I said, day by day, we have days where we're 50 percent globally. What you are probably very aware of, what I'm painfully aware of, is it's not evenly distributed. It's not like originally when we set out that goal, people were, some of our employees were expecting that, you know, every facility at 3M would have a solar panel on the roof and a, a wind turbine in the parking lot. That, that's not the way it works. You all know there's a lot of different ways that we approach the renewable energy area. And there's more sophisticated approaches in Europe and North America than many other parts of the world. So for example, um, as we're looking at, at but our global footprint, we, we are not even. So there are many countries in the world where we, we're having trouble getting that renewable energy. We're, we already have a footprint there. So it's not about deciding to go in. As a company who's 120 years old, we have a footprint in a lot of places. And it, it's, um, we haven't threatened anyone to leave for the reason of renewable energy yet, but um, we're definitely in discussions in um, many, many developing countries about how we improve our renewable energy footprint. When we installed um, our solar panels on our facilities in Singapore, um, we have a large manufacturing site there, and we were actually the largest single solar installation in the entire country. It's a small country, 
Um, and I don't know that that's still true today, but when we did the installation, we were the largest. And that's in the middle of Southeast Asia where there is so much more need and so much demand and opportunity. We are committed to making the shifts be closer and closer to the, where we have our operations as much as we possibly can. We have signed on with um, a number of companies who want us to be able to provide um, our products with a, a certificate of renewable energy as sourcing it. Um, and we partner with them to help get it as close as possible to the facility where we are doing the manufacturing. Um, before you get too excited, I need to point out that most of our, the largest area for manufacturing for us is actually um, the, the uh, North America, followed by Europe, but we also have significant uh, manufacturing in Asia and specifically China and Latin America. Um, and specifically in Asia and uh, China, we do not have the percentage renewable energy that we would like to have at this point. And we know that it has to happen through collaboration. Excellent. Thank you, Gail. And I think, you know, you're bringing up a great point is, is around what levels of collaboration is needed. And it's not just about how do we invent a new thing to get us all to net zero. It's actually about how do we help governments, businesses and others really move the dial with us. And I think that's a really important part of the alliance. Um, you know, and from from our vantage point at Student Energy, I can say that one thing we're really seeing is that the opportunity for young people to establish careers in renewables is very um, uneven around the world. And so, um, you know, that's something we're really excited to see is the growth of renewables and renewable businesses. So it's not just that you need to go to your master's at Imperial College <laughs> and then be able to establish your career, but that there are opportunities to do this around the world because so many young people are really excited to see this happen. Our, our research is showing that 83% would vote for a politician based on their energy policy. Um, so, so that's um, a really exciting piece to point out. Um, but speaking of which, I think also, you know, what we're also seeing a lot of, and I'm going to combine a couple of pieces here so people can feel free to, to chime in as they will. Um, you know, our demands for the higher standard across the board. I would, I would, I would agree with Gail that I think we're seeing seeing those calls everywhere, um, but particularly around supply chain, around being responsible for every piece of a business that you touch or all of your suppliers, and then also around human rights, around saying that you know communities and people are are the reason that we're doing this energy transition and there's no point in doing it if we're not going to also address those levels of equity issues. So um, I'd like to invite you all, maybe we'll make it a little bit more open um, um, to respond to either the supply chain or the human rights um, values within the Alliance. I could start with a, maybe with a, with a supply chain and another discussion that we had earlier. Um, and let's, let's get, um, I think you called it the elephant in the room, Morton. So, um, one of the interesting aspects of the whole COP, not just this discussion here, is that somebody has to pay for all of these uh, innovations and all of these, these, these uh, you know, the renewable energy rollout, the energy transition, um, moving to net zero. And um, there's, there's um, mixed evidence um, of, you know, of where that bill will necessarily end up, right? So I think 98% of our emissions are upstream in our value chain somewhere. So with, um, you know, with, with 3M or wherever else it is, and um, you know, huge um, diesel costs, for example, for, for, for transportation, um, very, very high costs for um, raw materials, particularly uh, steel. And so we recently um, produced a rolled out of our factory in Aalborg in Denmark, our first ever fully recyclable blade. Uh, and uh, you know, something to be that our technicians, the, the, the innovators are very proud of doing. And now we have to find a market for it somebody has to pay for a blade which is more expensive than the blades that we produce at the moment. And it's not clear yet you know, um, you know, whether the market for that will fully materialize. And so that's where we have to work with suppliers and we have to work with our customers. We have to work with, um, with governments to a certain extent to create a framework that creates the volumes and the demand for these new products that we're creating. Otherwise, you know, we're innovating um, uh, you know, without actually you know, finding an end customer. So that's, that's somewhere where you know, with collaboration um, may well be very profitable. Yeah, if I can just add uh, the exact same uh, trajectory, right? Uh, focusing on, on uh, fully recyclable blades, but also on the green steel part. You know, we're getting a lot of demands from our customers to uh, insert green steel uh, into our towers. And uh, we're happy to do so, and we're working with a lot of uh, steel suppliers and tower manufacturers to actually get to that point using green hydrogen in the production, et cetera, et cetera. So it's definitely possible to get green steel, but there is a price tag to that. 
you will increase the price of the turbine. And yet I have yet to see evidence that that price increase will be absorbed somewhere. Uh, and that's, that's really why we call it the elephant in the room because we can move in that direction. It's technologically feasible. It's also you know, the right thing to do, but where's, where's that cost gonna be placed? That's a great point. Salvatore, did you have any comments on this as well? Yes, um, about uh, supply chain and human rights. So let's start about supply chain. Uh, we have calculated uh, uh, as an L that if we spend uh, uh, 100 in terms of uh, what we used to, to purchase uh, in terms of uh, goods or services or work, our entire supply chain would spend 30 times uh, 100. So as an L, we have a huge responsibility in addressing all the market. And as uh, uh, we are the main largest, we are, we are the largest private operator in renewables in the world, we felt that the, we had this responsibility also to address our supply chain. Uh, because if I spend 100 and all the supply chain could spend 30 times more, so it means that if I start doing something and I collaborate with the supply chain, and I convince and persuade everyone to do its own part, we could leave a mark together. So for instance, we launched a, a project called the EPD, that stands for Environmental Product Declaration, uh, introducing in the tenders that we run to, to purchase uh, our goods, uh, a, a reward for the companies who would commit uh, in following the EPD approach. That basically means introducing some uh, technicalities like the life cycle assessment uh, to quantify the quantity of materials, uh, either uh, electricity, uh, the CO2 footprint, uh, the water footprints that they need uh, to manufacture a certain uh, blades uh, or PV modules, etc. And we said that they are supplier, if you commit uh, to apply this EPD approach to your product. So I will give you uh, a, um, a reward in the tender. It means I will be able to pay a higher price because you will follow me in this effort of making more sustainable the supply chain. And at the beginning, we launched three years ago, this approach in the first tender. Some people asked me, why are you going to pay more? And I said, it's not obvious that we are going to pay more. And the reality is after three years that we are applying this approach is that now it will become a requirement that all of our suppliers would have to respect if they want to participate to our tenders, if they want to work with the NEL. And we didn't see an increase of prices because if you leverage on circular economy, you put in action a new way to, to things, to design your goods, a new way to structure your processes. At the end, the increase of cost that is uh, theoretically foreseeable at the beginning could be absorbed in another way. So my point is that uh, there could be a cost. I'm not saying there will not, there, not with a, there will not be a cost, but we have still continued to work on the innovation and the, on the sustainability. At the end, we call it uh, innovability at the NEL because they are two parts of the same coin at the end of the day, to make sustainable the system. That means that uh, this extra cost should be absorbed along the entire value chain. We could change the materials, for instance. It is written nowhere that we have to continue to use steel for the next, uh, for the next future. And in fact, uh, we are already experimenting the wood as a, a different material to build some part of the equipment, uh, equipment we buy. That by the end, the wood could be also uh, a way to sequestrate the CO2, if, if you think to it. So innovation and sustainability should go on, and we have to continue working, uh, acting as a leader, because the company we are presenting here in, in, this, uh, in, in this event, we are leader in our sector, and we also should give the example, and we should address the market in going over a certain direction. Then there is the issue of the human rights. I mean, human rights, uh, what is human rights at the end of the day? It means a lot of things. If you, if you reckon to the fact that the climate change would impact uh, millions of people that perhaps they would have to migrate due to the fact that they, could, they will not be able to live in the cities or in the villages where we live today, this migration will cause tensions. And at the end, it could impact on the societal collapse on a societal collapse. So we have to stop this, we have to work to avoid this, 
by involving people right from the beginning, by involving not only these people, but also the people who are living in the more privileged and lucky countries in changing also our lifestyle. This is what we have to do. But we have also to work uh, involving them in the things that we do, in the spreading and distributing the benefits of our activity with all the people. We, are, we used to, to, to uh, approach uh, local territories with the CSV approach that stands for creating shared value. And I would like just to mention one, one specific project that we launched one month ago in, in Italy. Uh, we launched an initiative of lending crowdfunding. So we, we got money, we collect money from uh, the people who were resident in the municipality where we were we were uh, uh, developing a certain project and we gave them the possibility to participate with the lending crowdfunding to the investment and to have uh, an individual benefit. Because there are worldwide benefits that are for the world, but people also want to, they want to be involved and to have a, and to receive a, a personal individual benefit. So speaking about human rights, it means also speaking about society, speaking about how to engage the local territory to do more and to do something together with us, listening to them, designing our initiatives with them, but means also respecting the people who are from, uh, far away from our factory for our lucky countries uh, and finding the way uh, to find a plan B for them. Eh? Because today there is not plan B, unfortunately. Thank you. And I, I think you're making a great point is really all of these pieces are about what do we value and what are our values going forward. And I, I know that, you know, the, the narrative around renewables for so long has been, oh, great, the cost is dropping, the cost is dropping, which is true. But at what point do we also have to say, okay, there need to be costs built in for carbon, there need to be costs built in for the other pieces elsewhere so that we're not creating one challenge while we're trying to, to solve another, if you will. Um, and I think those are really great points, Salvatore, around how do we how do we look at the values of the industry and what we're doing going forward and try to make the best decision and and make sure that policy and the rest of the business landscape is on board for, for what will that take. Um, and so I do see that one question has come in virtually. I'd also like to invite the audience here if anyone has a question to go ahead and, and raise your hand. Um, great, we'll take uh, the question from you, sir. Um, so Merlin, I'm a two decade leader in the um, uh, UK based centre of expertise in sustainable energy, and we run the electricity storage network here, which is all the organisations involved in electricity storage, uh, batteries, etc. It's obviously quite a lot of, uh, of issues uh, related to the battery supply chain, and probably all broadly familiar with some of the materials and some of the places those materials come. It's been quite difficult, I think. Uh, to sort of, you know, to, to find uh, the international body of work or standards or initiatives that are going on to try and address those those issues, and we've been sort of trying to do it at a sort of country level, but that seems a bit a bit crazy. So I guess I'm kind of wondering whether anyone has any particular experience in in that area and the supply chain around storage and thinking and how we might be able to make. Uh, more rapid progress in addressing some of the, the obvious sustainability issues in that sector, which is clearly going to be a, a critical enabler to many of the options we've talked about. Definitely. So, for our panelists on Zoom, just in case you couldn't hear, looking into any standards around battery supply chain sustainability. Um, I don't know if, if Ben or Morton had, had a comment first. I think the lack of standards, I think you're hitting it right on the mark, you know, because it's not just on the on the battery sustainability or circularity. We are lacking uh, standards in sustainability measurements and data in data collection in general. I mean, uh, getting getting, uh, you know, the scope three emissions right and how you measure that and how you validate that and all that. I mean, there's so many actors. You know, they are trying to, you know, put their services, uh, you know, on, on getting scope three. It's just an example. Um, but I think we, we now need to sit down, maybe using this alliance, maybe other for industry collectively and define those standards because they're not, there's not someone just popping up and say, these are the standards. You know, this is going to be hard work from all of us to get to that point. So, so let's, let's get into action mode and, and get that sorted out, including also what do we do with, with battery um, or circularity. 
Uh, because again, I see this plethora of different types of companies now offering services in that area, but standards are lacking. So that, at least that's my, um, that's what I've been able to, to, to see across the, the industry. Does anyone have an example of where there might be standards around battery technology in terms of sustainability? Uh, right, we have a clear gap. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, I, I can take it. I mean, uh, uh, sustainability about battery is something that has to be worked uh, sensorly, but it's something that has no more complexity than any other sustainability of uh, any other product like modules uh, or PV modules or a wind turbine. I mean, the, the only difference is that the battery is uh, relatively recent uh, respect to other products that we know better. But just to give you an example, as an L Green Power in Spain, we are launching a project now in Compostilla where we will collect uh, uh, batteries from electric cars who have uh, reached their useful life. And together with some other players, local players, we will uh, treat them in order to recycle them and obtaining the nickel uh, and all the other um, materials that are raw materials that, by, by the way, uh, their prices is increasing day after day, as you can observe in the last month. So we are putting in place, acting as an orchestrator, an initiatives of circular economy that will help us also to recycle at the end of their useful life, the batteries. So being sustainable once more means uh, working together, leveraging on the ecosystem, acting uh, the big company as ours as orchestrators uh, defining a new business model, leveraging on innovation and sustainability at the same time. That at the end, the conjunction of this con concept for me is called the circular economy. So not everything has been defined yet, but there is an ongoing process uh, day after day where we are improving, uh, attacking the problems. Uh, and I'm sure that about batteries, we will come to a solution before then uh, what we did in the past with some other components. So it's not something that should prevent us from investing battery, the fact that we have not the solution yet, because there are so many efforts and there is so many money available also to foster innovation about these issues that, I mean, it, it should not be an excuse to say, what is the problem about battery? We cannot invest in battery because otherwise we will have another problem. No, ladies and gentlemen, we have to work on it. We have to design battery, like uh, uh, it was said before about the blades right for the beginning in order to be circular. And the technology in the meantime is being developed to make all the process sustainable. So I'm optimistic about it because I'm speaking about uh, things that we are really doing. It's not a dream. Thank you. And I think we'll move on to one question virtually and then I saw another one here in the audience. Um, so how are renewable energy companies addressing scope three emissions from capital goods specifically? I think Morton had touched on this a little bit, but any other comments on that? I don't really have it. I can't really add but very much, I'm afraid, to what Morton uh, said earlier, other than that, you know, um, the, with the greater transparency that comes from uh, the scrutiny uh, that we're all under uh, and that we are presenting to uh, to investors and other stakeholders, um, you know, ultimately we'll find solutions uh, to all these issues. Um, and with regard to, you know, re re reducing the emissions uh, and reducing consumption overall, um, the one thing that our industry has in spades is a, a, a kind of huge innovative uh, capacity. Uh, and um, uh, if there is a solution to be found, our engineers will find it. Yeah, on scope three, I mean, we are just as Enel is, is uh, pushing uh, Ben and me to, uh, to reduce our emissions and being compliant with the 1.5. We, of course, doing that with our suppliers. Uh, and we are really targeting, first of all, the top 50 batch now of our key suppliers and taking them through the whole sustainability and circularity process. Because just as Enel says to us, you know, you can't actually participate in this tender if you don't comply. We will, of course, we're saying the same to our suppliers. So in that way, you know, the system is working. Um, and and that, is, that is, you know, super exciting and also creates a space for lots of new opportunities because a lot of our supply base they have to start investing into renewables in order for, for them to be compliant. So it, it becomes full circle somehow and really exciting to see how much is going on. Uh, I think where uh, Ben and I should probably sit down is that because we have many of the same suppliers, right? 
and uh, and I think at some point we back to the standards discussion here. We should, as an industry, say this is what we collectively will require for these types of suppliers and then these types of suppliers because right now we're just shooting at them at, at all different angles, and, and that that's where we need to be better at collaborating. No time like the present for the alliance. Um, Gail, did you have any thoughts on scope three missions from an industrial perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think scope three for us, it's both the upstream piece, which very much uh, fits with what's been discussed so far, but also the downstream piece. And I think that, um, so one of the things that you're talking about when align, aligning what's needed, if we can have those inquiries that are coming about what is the carbon footprint for my product or what, it, how is this made with renewable energy or all that, if, if we could have a common form for that, that would be really useful. Right now we're dealing with thousands and thousands of, of customers asking us with their own unique forms. So I really love when they come together and there's a common way of approaching that. So if you guys, Morton and Ben, if you get talking, maybe you can agree on a common way to ask for it. We see that um, one of the comments that was made before was kind of this idea of unintended consequences or looking at the whole view. Salvador was talking about something that may look like it's, a, like it's an increase in cost for the, the widget, if you will. But when you look at the whole ecosystem of a product, it actually reduces the cost and sustainability comes in there. That's where our sustainability value commitments come in. And that's where we do such important work on scope three with our customers. Because for us, scope three is very much about our customers reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's the um, renewable energy industry or the automotive industry or, um, or retail. Uh, we need to work collaboratively with them to find ways to help us all reduce our carbon footprint and increase the circular economy. Two things that should go well together, although sometimes they have their challenges. And I think that's that's such an important piece of, of what we need to do every day is to, to make sure that we're looking at things under the right scale and that we're not incurring unintended consequences on that. Um, and, and, and it crosses over into the human rights space as well. So for us, that's a really big focus is understanding what our customers tell us they need as well as what we see on a mega trends perspective so that we can work collectively to reduce emissions in our own operations and with our customers. And that really gets to the scope three above and beyond what we do with um, our suppliers as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, and maybe we'll move on to this question in the audience here. Oh, you're okay? Oh, sorry. Hi, um, my name is Eddie Rich. I'm the uh, CEO of the International Hydro Power Association. I'm sorry I've missed the beginning of this, but um, uh, it's kind of an offer um, that I want to make and, um, and uh, want to hear um, a little bit more from you about. Um, we've, in our sector, had obviously a lot of experiences around uh, sustainability in hydropower, and we've worked uh, over the last 15 years with um the ngos with governments and um the the banks to develop a sustainability standard it's not ours it belongs to them it, it, it's uh, independently assessed um what would you guys feel about um us sort of coming together and trying to eventually develop or recognizing that we've got different issues in different renewable sectors but a sustainability framework for renewables um, that covers all of all of these, and then the buyer knows that not only is the renewable we're getting renewable, but it's also sustainable. It's clean and it's green. Bring it on! Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's uh, note that down as an action point after today, uh, because I, I think that's exactly what is needed. So uh, so I'll take you up on that. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I would make a comment and I think that's great. So bring it on. And I hope that it's really thinking about sustainability in the broader sense. I know one of the things that we've learned in our renewable energy journey is um, we, we got into it. Our first installations were on site at our own properties and through power purchase agreements. And as we moved on, we started to pay more, more and more attention to um, how the communities were impacted. So this kind of gets back to the human rights sort of discussion and, and the effect on people. Because often our manufacturing sites are located in towns or villages where we're one of the larger employers. 
And as such, if we pull all of our, say we were to do an installation where we took um, on-site solar or wind and we pulled it off the grid for the community, well, that might give some good jobs for the community, at least in the short term, that could be a good thing. But there was also an unintended consequence that by doing that, we would find that the, the local power companies um, could cause their, their rates to increase, could have more challenges at greening the grid overall, and could have um, you know, very challenging um, cost effects for the local community. And that certainly was not an intention that we wanted to have happen. So as we started rolling out, say, I want to say beyond about 25% global renewable electricity, we started to bring in that social component a lot more as well. And I think it's a really important consideration. So as we've gone forward, we've done a, a lot more of our um, renewable energy work has actually been in collaboration with the local power companies in ways that help yes, bring in the jobs that we would have if we had done it on our own, but also bring in um, an infrastructure that allows for the community to be more, um, to, to benefit more from that transformation that we're helping happen in those communities. And I don't know if that's something that others have been involved with, but I, I know it's been an aha for us, say in the last five or so years, that there, there really are, are better ways for the communities and less good ways for the communities for us to be procuring our renewable energy. So um, it's been a bit of an aha, and, and I don't know with Hodge Power if that's part of what you consider in your sustainability approach as well, but it's a really important consideration for us. Yes, Meredith, if possible, would you like to add something more about this concept of relationships with the territory and with the local communities? That basically is what I referred before as a creating shared value methodology. I remember speaking about hydro some years ago, we had hydro plants, we still have hydro plants in Chile, for instance, and uh, uh, we used to run our plants uh, without any problem, and uh, a company close to ours with another hydro plant, uh, let's say our neighbors, uh, they, they were stopped by local people. They literally entered their plants and uh, stopped them from operating the plant. And we never experienced this kind of problem because our relationships with these communities was different with respect to our neighbor. Uh, let me give you, give you an example. Let me give you an example about what creating shared value mean. Uh, we installed, for instance, a, a PV plant, okay? In that particular area, doing our uh, uh, materiality analysis, uh, our materiality matrix, we understood there was a need of, uh, of a job there, okay? So there, there was a high unemployment and people were not trained to do a particular job. So we said, look, what we can do here is to take the chance that we are here, we are present physically on this territory and we can train some of these people to be eco carpenter. And we used the waste of our PV panels, the wooden pallets, we gave them for free and we trained them to use this wood and to make furniture. And then we bought also this furniture and we helped them to start a micro enterprise to sell on the internet, this furniture. So we solved the problem of the job, we invested in training, we avoided the waste of wood, so this is something that is beneficial for everyone. This is creating shared value, shared among the different participants to these particular initiatives. So my point is that if you address properly your development in a certain area, if you listen to the territory, if you do with the methodology, at the end, uh, I mean, uh, there is benefit for everyone and everyone is happy. Thank you. And then I think we have one final question here and then we'll wrap up. Um, hi, my name is Erin Stewart. I'm the Managing Director of Indigenous Clean Energy. We work with Indigenous communities across Canada and the globe on energy transition projects. Um, my question is specifically about integration in remote diesel dependent areas and specific Arctic, in Arctic environments. We have a lack of wind projects in our Canadian north. We're working on one of the first uh, fully integrated microgrid systems with wind, diesel and battery right now in our, our northern east um, Arctic. I'm just wondering in terms of your experience in Arctic and remote uh, regions, our biggest problem here is IPP policy and uh, just costs and also manufacturing warranty, but wondering if you could speak to that. I can at least say that 
the, from a technology point of view, uh, smaller integrated systems using wind, solar, and storage technologies can completely remove that diesel diesel piece of that equation, and and give availabilities that are almost like a twenty four seven power plant. So as soon as possible, we have to phase out the diesel also for cost reasons. Uh, so that is techno technologically feasible, and we have all kinds of cold climate solutions into built into the technologies that can withstand whatever weather conditions are in those areas. We have seen actually a couple of sites, uh, northern Russia and Siberia, we're building very far up north in Scandinavia. And so there, there are lots of opportunities to look, uh, examples to look at. So definitely let us talk after, after the session here. No, and just I mean, on that point, that was one of the interesting things that came up last year when the with the storms in the United States in Texas, when suddenly it was well, these things don't work when it's cold and well, they, they yes, they do if they work in the Arctic Circle, they can work in Texas during a storm. Um, but there, there, there are other challenges, as, you know, as well, that just the, the building of the of the of the wind farms in these areas is, ex, you know, is extremely difficult. And when you talk about you know, working closely with local communities, this is, as I said earlier, there's a, there is a cost to everything. Um, and, you know, the planning um uh, work that needs to go in ahead of those is you know is very detailed and, and very important you need to bring the community with you so um not easy but but certainly possible wonderful and i'm not sure if there are any other thoughts on that from our virtual panelists yes i just would like to add uh, something more i agree with the the the, the colleagues uh, and it is not a technology issue to provide 24 uh, 7 electricity in these particular areas we also have experienced different projects, also in harsh condition, like uh, indigenous community living uh, 4,800 meters above the, the, the sea level. So in very harsh condition, winter and summer. And, and they were dependent from generators that by the way, at these heights, they are not very efficient anyway. And they now rely on uh, wind plus PV plus battery systems to provide 24 hours, seven electricity. The problem of this particular, with an off-grid solution, by the way, so they're not connected to the grid. The problem of this solution is the cost, obviously, because when you can um, manufacture its component in a high scale and you can do big plants, you tend to have economy of scale. When you have to install components and plants on these particular remote areas, the cost is higher. So the problem is the cost, who is going to pay for this. This is the typical example where you should receive some incentive from the government, from whatever public sector, in order to make this available. In any case, this is the cheapest uh, solution compared to others, because relying on a diesel will be more expensive and more inefficient uh, and less uh, climate compliant anyway. But in any case, uh, in this particular case, uh, also these uh, alternative solutions are expensive. So it is something that should be defined together with the proper regulators in these particular areas. Thank you. All right, and I think with that, we're just about out of time here, but I would like to thank all of our panelists for joining today. I feel like we started off on a great foot with, you know, the industry has really grown up and now it's time to lead on the energy transition. And I'm really excited for one to see all of these new pieces of thinking around circular economy, human rights, the supply chain and net zero and, and showing people how serious the industry can be and how, how we can rise to the challenge of of what is the higher standard and what higher standard do we have going forward globally. So, um, and I know that, you know, young people around the world have been a big part of putting the pressure on governments to make, make these types of commitments possible from a policy perspective. And I'm excited to see more partnerships, um, you know, as, as those people grow up, become employees of these companies um, and to see more partnerships on how we continue to raise the bar going forward globally. So congratulations to everyone on the launch of the Global Alliance and look forward to seeing amazing things coming out of it. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone, bye.